Hey, Feel Good Fathers, thanks for tuning in and joining us. I'm here with my good buddy, Jonathan Field, and he and I have had multiple conversations. I think we've known each other for about a year now, and we've we probably met offline and, and multiple occasions, I think at least five or six times, and we've had multiple discussions just about his life and, and my life and something that we're both super passionate about, which is this whole game, this whole game of fatherhood. And uh, we were just talking off air and I was, I was doing my regular pre-interview preamble. And I was just like, you know, today I, I, I typically have a set of questions and I know I have a couple, but I think what I really like to do is just have an open discussion sort of about Jonathan and his life and stuff he's been through because it's really inspiring and moving. And it helps me really understand that uh, in multiple times in my life, and we'll get, kind of get into this story, that you can overcome things in your life and you can pick yourself up. And as you know, if you're a feel good father, it doesn't matter where you've come from because everything that's happened in the past is a gift to you because it's exactly what you needed to be where you are right today. So if you're listening to this, I'd like to uh, give you a heartfelt welcome to introduce you to my good buddy, Jonathan Field. Thank you. Good to be here. No problem. We were talking off air a little bit about your story. So can we do like a elevator level hey what are the bullet points that we should know about to introduce us to this discussion yeah so uh elevator quick story of my life um raised without uh, affirmation as a child um, not ever really told that i was valuable mm. began to believe that myself as a child i rejected myself and Ended up hating myself at a very young age and um, 16 years old, I started doing meth with um, my brother's friends, dropped out of high school at 17 to follow the Grateful Dead, traveled around the country, selling uh, drugs and hippie type uh, hallucinogenic substances. And um, my brother ended up getting hooked on heroin while we were following the Grateful Dead. He overdosed, passed away. Lost him uh, when I was 17. He was 20. And um, he was my hero growing up. So I, I was really kind of lost at that point. I quit doing drugs. I became a Christian and um, inherited some money, fell back into drugs and the women and everything like that. And then that that was a very long time of um, of trying to quit doing it, but not really being satisfied with that. Started a family, had my first son, named him after my brother who I lost to carry on his name. And then that relationship with his mom didn't work out. And uh, we ended up getting divorced. I ended up going to jail. I woke up in jail one day and I got a letter saying that I was divorced in Arizona. You don't have to sign any papers. Uh, in fact, I, I told my ex-wife at the time, I said, you know, I don't believe in divorce. I, I'm, I'm not going to sign the paperwork. And uh, she very arrogantly said, well, and we got married in Arizona and in Arizona, I don't need your, we don't need to get your permission. So she proved that one day while I was sitting in jail, I got a, uh, a letter saying I was divorced and was separated from my son, went down a really dark path of um, drugs, jail. Um, I was addicted to meth uh, from the time I was 16 until I was 32 years old went to prison for um, crimes I did while I was on drugs. And at 32 years old, I finally figured out how to quit doing meth. And um, it, it wasn't just meth. I was also addicted to sex. I was introduced to pornography at three years old. Um, so I have been obsessed with sex my whole life. And even to this very day, at times, I still struggle with that. You know, it's just been something. I don't have any memory of my life of not wanting to have sex. It's pretty crazy. I was trying to have sex at four years old um, with one of my mom's friends' uh, children, daughters. And, um, and uh, yeah, so at 32, I finally figured out how to beat that, how to overcome the, uh, the meth and the sex. And um, started a family, started a business. Everything was going awesome. Uh, help start a men's group at my church that they had been trying to start for 30 years. And we had started this successful men's group and uh, bought a house and everything was awesome. And then I got targeted by the federal 
government and they charged me with conspiracy to commit uh, wire and mail fraud for my business. I fought the government, lost, got sentenced to five years in prison and um, got out about a year ago. And that's the quickest overview I think I can give of my life. But yeah, I've been through, been through a lot. And there are, I just in this brief discussion, there's a handful of things that I've learned about <laughs> you. So uh, I didn't know about the Grateful Dead. I'd love to ask you about that later on. Um, but I, I just recently watched a video. It was an interview uh, with, um, I think it's like Mr. Gamer. I think he's, he's this influencer. I'm, I'm probably not even getting his name correct. But he talked about uh, uh, porn addiction. Mm. So, and what he was saying was that um, porn addiction actually isn't addiction to sex. Porn addiction is it's it it activates porn specifically activates the same uh, dependencies in your brain as like a meth or heroin or or mm. some sort of actual substance abuse. And so, it's really it's it's very interesting in that way. Um, and also, I think the one thing that uh, in the feel good fatherly community that we should acknowledge is that uh, if you need help with porn, like if you need help with that, that it should be something that you can have a conversation about. Mm -hmm. I had uh, Fred Stoker on uh, definitely a couple months ago and, and he talked about um, specifically uh, battling and, and the whole idea was, is like on the idea of sexual purity. So sexual purity with your wife. And it was about, um, turning all that sexual energy, turning all that into a focus towards your wife and towards um, that relationship. And so I think in that world, it's like the being involved and trying to figure out the most at the most possible, what are the, what are the tools that we can equip our sons with? Uh, if you have daughters like me, what are the pieces of education that you can use to inform them about the realities of the world and also just being aware and present to what does society look like from a consumption, from a acceptable practice world. Uh, you know, the pornography is definitely one of those conversations to have. And I think, I, I think we're roughly, I think we're, we're close enough in age that we have a, a similar upbringing that um, widespread porn was something that kind of started in the eighties um, and then really kind of hit its hit its stride with the internet in the uh, late '90s, early um, it's late '90s, early 2000s. Um, so what? Let, let's 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 kind of hang out with this thread. So like, what was it that you did to you know in brief to kind of address that situation? But then the next thing I want to talk about is how are we taking this learning and applying it to your family like how are you taking an acknowledgement of your sex your sex and porn addiction uh, addiction and then educating your sons on this and just saying like hey man this is i would assume that you're having that conversation <laughs> so let me know if you're not not yet not well i have had i did recently have the sex conversation with my uh he just turned 11 so while he, when he was 10 years old and um i i think a lot of it has to do with um protecting him Man, mm. it was Jay. It was it was actually so amazing for me to sit down with uh, with my ten year old at the time and say, "Hey, do you know where babies come from?" And he's like, "No," and he didn't know what sex was. And I and the reason why I had the conversation is it's only a matter of time before he learns about it, and I want him to learn about it from me in a proper way, the way that mm. God designed it way and not in a perverted way that I learned. So yeah, to be able to have that conversation with him uh, and to just break down the mechanics of it. And, and he was just like, what? So it, it's like this. And, and, and yeah, it was so cool because here he is at 10. And, and I was, I think that that I've prayed for him his whole life. Um, that God would just protect him from that so that he could grow up having a healthy understanding of what it is. You know, I was introduced to it at three years old. My grandfather was like this uh, cutting edge tech guy. He, he gave us the first computer, the Commodore 64. So when I was a little kid, I had that at my house and he put this satellite in our backyard and, um, 
and it was those big ones that you installed and you had to push a button and it point to the, to the satellite. And I remember being that age, three years old, my mom and dad weren't there. And I had an older half brother, Dana, he was nine years older than me. And, uh, he was all my life. He was the guy that, that had the pornos under his bed and, um, they were watching. I still remember it to this day, American triple ecstasy. And that was, uh, that was on the screen and I was just like hardcore pornography. So, so, uh, I haven't had the conversation about porn with my son yet, but I did get to have the conversation with him and, and I was so thankful and I'm still so thankful that he wasn't introduced to it like in a perverted way like I was because even to me I think that's kind of miraculous at 10 years old in the world we live in if you compare it to like you said the 80s maybe things have gotten a little bit better with that you would think that they wouldn't with the internet and everything else um but yeah so to be able to have that conversation with him it was amazing and and eventually I will but as it comes up you know I, I do have these conversations with him I, th I think one of the, the crazy things about that age group is that you're, you're just starting to see that peer, that peer pressure and not from a, Hey, everybody else is doing it, but more from a, Hey, I found this thing. It's pretty cool. Do you want to see it? Kind of, um, I, I guess I would call it even like innocent sharing, but, uh, the, the content that can be shared is not innocent. You know, um, I get, uh, at, on occasion, the, the, the thing that I'm watching now is that my daughter has this, my oldest has this love for editing little videos. And so she and her friends online are just making little, um, what's it called? Cap cuts. I think mm -hmm. the little phone, mm -hmm. phone thing. She's just recording herself using some filters, you know, adding some text, watching stuff. And I'm encouraging it from a marketing perspective. Cause I mean, imagine, imagine a world where you were learning a hardcore marketing skill at like right. 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the big things, you know, we're talking about skill, skill development and really having a conversation about sex and healthy sexuality. Um, you know, if you're a Christian from, from God's perspective, if you're secular, just, just healthy sexual habits. Um, imagine having that world where you're, you can take what you've learned, which is what you did with your son you can take what you've learned and apply that wisdom. And that's really what, what the thriving and the skill skill transfer is down to the next generation. I mean, and that's the feel good fatherhood way. I would absolutely love to have a brief conversation right now about grateful dead. And, and this might be a weird question. Um, Cause you were, you were doing your thing there. What did, what are you applying from that experience to today as a father? Hmm. Well, I was raised to a, uh, I was raised by a narcissist, my mother. Um, in fact, she disowned me like, um, 14, 15 years ago. She's not met any of my children. Um, and she was very hands off, um, just let us do whatever we wanted. You know, when I was mm. a kid, when I was a kid, I, I thought that was because my mom loved me so much. And I, I even remember this conversation, this, this other kid, when I was in like fifth or sixth grade, he said, your mom doesn't love you. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, she, I said, he said, she lets you do anything you want. She doesn't love you. I'm like, that's why she loves me. But, but honestly, man, I, if you love your children, you don't let them do whatever they want. You know, mm. that, you don't just let them uh, do anything they want and go anywhere they want as a, as a kid. I didn't ever ask, have to ask my mom permission for anything. Everything was yes. It was like, hey, mom, I'm going to hang out with so-and-so. going to go spend the night with so-and-so. I'll be back tomorrow, okay? Okay. Everything was always okay. So if there was one thing as, as far as parenting, it, was, it would be that children need to hear no. And, um, and if you love your children, you discipline them, and, and you, you don't just let them go anywhere at any time. I think the, I think the, the really the, 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 the social backlash against the, that specific concept is that people think that being disciplinarian is a, it's a constant thing. And so we have very, you know, we have a, a couple of just principles and we try to apply them in this house. And a lot of it, it, it comes down to um, what real creativity is, what real play is that it's really within the bounds of, of some sort of system of rules. So 
creativity, like the best creativity is not unconstrained. That's not real creativity. Creativity is actually constrained. Uh, this is, uh, I think, discussed in, in Ruben's new book, Creativity, and something I learned when I was making games and stuff like that. Uh, why am I bringing up creativity, right? Because the discipline and the rules and the showing your kids what not to do and having that in place gives them permission what to do and allows them to extrapolate from there. It's the same thing. We'll, we'll jump into like the 10 commandments of Christianity, right? That the 10 commandments thou shalt not it's phrased in a very specific way. Cause then it implies all the things you should do by saying what you shouldn't do. And so I think that's a really great lesson right there. Um, what was it that sort of helped you develop more of your internal value? So a, a big piece of feel good fatherhood is knowing yourself, knowing what drives you doing the hard work, improving yourself, personal development. Uh, you know, cause if you, if you don't love yourself, you're, you're not loving anybody else. So for you, you know, you grew up in a world where nobody ever told you that you were valuable. So walk us through, what what you did to to develop that what happened um jay it's a pretty simple answer with that for me it all everything i learned came from the bible everything came from the word of god and 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 beginning to value it as not just a book um but valuing it for what the book what the contents of the book actually says it is and um i had to make god's word first place and it's like you are kind of a talk about creativity. You're, you're, you're like a blank canvas. And if you don't have something to fall back on, the world is going to paint its own picture of you and it's going to tell you who you are. And, and I was told who I was my whole life. And that was somebody who wasn't valuable. You know, I mentioned my brother, Jacob, who I latched onto and he was my hero. I just wanted to be around him. And as kids, when we were little, I was constantly rejected by him uh, as any big brother. You know, I didn't have a father figure around. And so I, my father figure and my hero became a kid who was three years older than me. And I cramped his style. He, doesn't want, he didn't want me around, so I, he rejected me. And so um, I was told all sorts of terrible things just so that I wouldn't ask my mom to make him take me with him, you know, because sometimes she would force him to, to take me along with him. And um, that's when he would be the most, you know, the meanest and everything like that. So, but, but at that young age, I began to believe those things. The one person I wanted more than anything rejected me and nothing I did was good in, enough. No matter how much I begged, no matter how, no matter what, I just wasn't good enough for him. So I, I was rejected, but, it was a process for me of learning what does the Bible say about me? What does God say about me? As a kid, I thought that God was mad at me all the time and just disgusted by me. So uh, because I was disgusted by me and, you know, he saw everything about me. And why did, why did you, why did you assume God thought that? Because that's the only, those are the only relationships I had in my life. I was not, I wasn't good enough. And, um, but I also had these secret things and God saw every part of me. And so the things that I was secretly, that I was ashamed of, that I would never tell anybody about those things, I was like, well, God sees everything. So he has to, why does he, he can't love me. Like he, he he's got to be mad at me right now. And, and he's got to be just barely holding me by my foot over hell. And if I screw up one more time, he's going to drop, he's going to drop me. But as I began to not, take other people's word for who God is, but I began to find it for myself in the Bible. That's like, a, a, that's when the layers began to fall off the old layers. And I began to adopt what he said. And ultimately the, the greatest freeing moment for me was when I decided to put God's word first place above everything in my life. And that was the measuring stick. So if, if one of the God's word, no, if God's word the said it, audience I was going to believe that and really I was going to uh, accept that as, as truth for myself. Got it. One of the things that is, um, really critical, I think to communicate that I, I know we could do a better job of is what is the specific, like, what are the verse verses? What are the 
sentences. How did you adopt that? Because I know that in the Christian community, we talk a lot about that identity, about accepting God's word, you know, uh, leveling your self image up to how God sees you, that kind of jazz. Mm -hmm. But it's, if you're not in that world, there's gotta be, there's a stepping stone. So what were the specific verses or specific stories in the Bible that really helped you develop that identity? Well, the most important verses in the Bible uh, for Christians would be the books that were written specifically to Christians. Um, So all of the epistles, the books from Paul to the church, if you've given your life to Jesus and you are now, the Bible says that you are part of his body, you are the church. And so you look for those books the epistles are really going to be what you base your life off of because these are written specifically to you, to the believer. So one thing that I've done. What books are those? Hold on. What books are those? Oh, so you have Romans, first, second Corinthians, any, just about any book written by Paul. Okay. Um, You have, um, yeah. So all of Paul's writings would be epistles to the church. Um, Then you have first and second Peter. Uh, first John, especially second and third John, they're, so, they're, they're really small books. Um, so these are books specifically written to the church. And one thing that I did, and, and I still do to this day is I turn it into the first person. So this book is written to me. So anytime you're saying you, you know, I would say, I, and I would almost pray it back to God, Lord, Lord, thank you. I am. And so I, I would just read it back in the first person. So there is a specific verse that says that, uh, that Paul said that any man who's in Christ is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. Um, now he's specifically speaking about your spirit because we are spirits having a physical experience. And so I identify as the spirit. You know, when I die, I'm gonna, when I go to heaven, I'll get a new body. My, my, my soul will be renewed. But who I am right now, is a spirit. And so I identify as that. And, and in Ephesians, Paul says that we were created when we were born again, we were created in righteousness and true holiness. So the real me is not a drug addict or a sex addict or unworthy. The real me is just like God created and righteous. I'm righteous. I'm holy. So these are identifying verses that you find in the Bible that, you know, when, when I feel unworthy, I I stop and, and, and I say, Lord, thanks that you have made me worthy, that I am worthy. And, and, and there's another verse that says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that's, I used to think that was like a signet seal, like a stamp. Mm-hmm. But no, it's like if you were to vacuum seal something, it keeps you perfect, mm-hmm. holy, righteous, brand new. You know, you look at a, a toy and it's brand new packaging. It's way more valuable because it's in that packaging and it's been preserved and kept new. Well, that's what happens when you get born again. It says that the old spirit passes away. You die and you get born again, a brand new thing. And it's not something that you feel because you don't feel with your spirit. You feel with your your body. You can sense it sometimes. You can feel an anointing on your body, but in your spirit, you're not feeling it. So I had to stop living by what I felt. Because what I felt was, I'm a loser, I'm a drug addict. And I said it all the time. Here I was as a Christian, I would tell people, man, I'm a drug addict, I'm a meth addict, I'm a sex addict. I said that all the time. And for me to change, after I went to rehab and I tried hundreds of times to quit, went to jail, in and out of jail, what changed in my life was for me to start saying what God said about me as, man, I'm, I am holy, I am righteous. I am one with God. The truth about God is the truth about me. And I began to create my own emotions and hack my own brain. You know, by being thankful, you can create positive emotions associated with a new thought and a new belief. And the best way that I found to do that is to, this little hack would be to be the alchemist of my own brain and to think my own thoughts so that I can start releasing positive chemicals in my brain. So just saying, God, thank you. You said it's true. Or if I'm, I'm faced with a, a situation that looks impossible. Thank you, God. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, but I know you are. And I'm in your hands, God. And I just sit, you sit in that place, hmm. in that thankfulness until you feel it. 
You sit in it until you feel it. And as you feel it, it begins to become more real and more solid in your life. Because so many of our past experiences and our hangups are tied to emotions, negative emotions. You think these negative thoughts and it creates that same negative chemical in your brain. So I love studying, listening to what Joe Dispenza says, because he talks about a lot of this stuff. And this is all like, none of this stuff contradicts scripture. And in fact, all of the science that he talks about of being the alchemist of your own brain and creating these chemicals and learning to sit in those feelings through meditation. Uh, it, it's, it all is biblically supported. You know, as Christians, we're supposed to renew our mind. And there's no better way to do that than to begin to think positive thoughts, being thankful. It, it, it takes time, but man, you can do it right now. You could be negative, thinking something negative, and you've got all these crazy things going on in your brain and these emotions, which are chemicals. And you can stop and you can pause and you can meditate and be thankful that God's got you in his hands and that he's promised to work everything out for your good. And if you sit in that place, then you'll start to experience those emotions. And then before long, it becomes your reality. And uh, then it just, for me now, it's just like normal. Like I I get in negative patterns too, but it's so, I I stay there less because I, I just believe that there is a amazing God who's better than I could ever imagine on my side, the best father ever. He invented fatherhood. Mm -hmm. He is my dad. He is the perfect one. And he's, I've given my life to him and, and he's, he's, he's working everything out. He's, he's, even when things that happen to me that aren't supposed to happen, he has a way of turning it into something beautiful. And, um, even when we have to go through pain and suffering, we're not doing it alone. And we know that this suffering, I'm not, I'm not going to be a victim. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to help other people who are feeling hopeless. You know, so every time the devil comes to attack me, I vow that I'm going to make him pay. He still, he still takes a risk. He's taking a risk every time he comes in my life. But I vowed I'm going to make him pay for it. Every time I suffer, I'm going to use that and I'm going to help somebody else that's going through suffering. This this reminds me of of a of a joke. Uh, you know what what size shoe does the devil wear? <laughs> it's a cheesy dad joke, but I love it, man. What size shoe does the devil wear? None. He's been defeated. Yes. He has been defeated. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I I I love that. I think I think this is the, you know, I I really think you know as a Christian myself, and you know, feel good father. It really is about you know, more, more general principles and, you know, and we're really trying to be as inclusive as we can of, of just the fatherhood role. And that's really what the focus on is on, but, you know, I, I would be disingenuous if I didn't say a lot of it was informed by the model uh, of Christianity and the model mm-hmm. of, of God to, you know, for me specifically, God to Adam and Eve and God throughout uh, some parts of the, well, all parts of the old Testament and then Jesus and the new Testament and that kind of jazz. Um, so that's definitely that idea. I, I love that idea of gratitude and and, and thankfulness, uh, being really appreciative of, I said it right in the beginning as I was introing, uh, everything that's happened to you is a gift. You, you are who you are right now because uh, everything that you are going through, everything, all the discussions, all the learning, you couldn't have it. You wouldn't be aware of it. You would not be open to it if your past had not happened. And so... Um, uh, one day I'll have more of a theological discussion, but, uh, not so much for today. Cause I'd really like to discuss, um, you started a business at a certain point mm-hmm. and I really want to take sort of, we we've understood a little bit of the transformation. We've understood sort of where you came from. We understood how, how do you replace these negative emotions? And now we're talking about sort of in the more physical world, how do you create something that is uh, more of a traditional level of success? I'd love to get your take on business. So I ended up going to prison over the business that I started. And um, what's crazy about it is that it's still there. It wasn't uh, a completely illegitimate business. It just turned into what it was. It's, um... But for me, I couldn't, I couldn't keep a job. I was a meth addict for from the time I was 16, really, I mean, it was really bad after my ex-wife left. Um, I just used that. That was my coping mechanism. And and that was the Novocaine for the beliefs that I had about myself. Hmm. You know, the eye that you see through your perspective 
is uh, uh, it, it impacts you. And it's like sometimes if you have these false things that you're believing in this this tainted eye that you're seeing life through, then the drugs kind of work as like Novocaine. Um, because I just felt like the biggest loser and I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't keep a job because I stayed on meth and I just literally was on meth and sleeping with woman after woman after woman every day. And uh, I went down a really dark path, went to prison, but, but my thing is I couldn't really keep a job, um, because of that addiction. So, Mm. um, once, and, and then because I had been to prison when I finally got sober, the only jobs I could find were dead end jobs. So that's when I created my business out of uh, necessity because uh, I couldn't get a sales job again because I had been to prison for fraud, for identity theft. I was stealing people's identity for a a period there. I had a career of about three months before the cops busted me. I I wasn't the greatest at it. I got caught pretty much right away. And, um, but either way that messed up my sales career. But as far as business, I, had to create something of my own. And then once I started it, it was amazing. I loved it. It was the first thing I had ever done in my life that I loved. And I don't know if I'm answering your question well, but uh, what is business to me is a, that's a hard answer for me, but I do love being in business for myself. I've recently started another business as well uh, that I'm, I, I like helping people with their businesses. So I think the, I think you said what it, what it means to you and, and that there was a, um, uh, there was sort of this absence of, of meaning and purpose in your life. And there was a, a continued, uh, I, I have to use the word, I, even though I don't really mean it, like a, a continued, I'll say set of lessons or failures that, that had occurred. You couldn't keep down the traditional path and the traditional path isn't right for everybody. You know, uh, part of the feel good father way is that, you know, if, if the best way for you is to be the best individual contributor, employee, great, go do that. If the best way for you to, is to be the best 1099, which is typically of sales, we were just talking about that, some sort of sales or selling position, go do that. If the best way for you is to go be a business owner, which is what you're talking about, which is effectively a business owner as a person that's creating a system, right, to mm-hmm. generate income, then go do that, <laughs> right? And then there's investor. We don't have to get into it too much. Um, but, you know, I think, I think the core idea is what you explained was that, hey, this is how you found some purpose. This is something that you enjoy doing. You pursued something that you were passionate about and that led you down a pretty positive path and it gave you a good taste. And now you're on this other side of it. Now you've fixed some of the internal game. And this is very feel good father. Start with the inside, work your way out. Mm-hmm. Um, you started with this internal game. You've addressed that. And now, now you're being called to help other people with their businesses. So tell, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I've recently started, and it's very new, with um, helping businesses grow, and it's kind of a, a guaranteed thing, which it, which I love about it is uh, we guarantee to increase the business's profits by twenty percent um, through through cutting costs and also through increasing um, the prices. Uh, but but it's pretty much for all all businesses, but yeah, that's a, that's a brand new thing. And that's up my alley. Uh, my, you know, when I was in the years when I was on meth, there were times where I was really functional after my, after my ex-wife left me. And I told you, I went down a real dark path. Like I couldn't, I couldn't go in there and, and it was sales jobs and, and I was up all night on drugs. So I couldn't really stay in control of the conversation. I wasn't mentally strong enough. Um, but Prior to that, I did find a lot of success in sales jobs. I had door-to-door jobs. I had telemarketing jobs, um, business coaching jobs back then. And I did, I always excelled. Um, So when I went to prison and for fraud, then that really ruined that for me um, to work for somebody else. And my grandfather was super successful. So so business has been a, a, a really important thing in my life. And so... I'm really passionate about helping people get free from addictions and, you know, giving them hope when everything looks hopeless, because if I can make it through that and still keep a positive attitude and still, and overcome that, then I really feel like I can help a lot of people with that. But as far as for making money at this point, it's the business coaching thing. 
That's awesome. Tell me a little bit about what you learned from your grandfather. That must have been an interesting relationship. Well, he wasn't around a whole lot of my life. Um, and unfortunately, a good portion of my life, uh, being raised to a narcissistic mother, she always talked bad about everybody. So he was pretty much my dad when I realized that he was like a hands-off dad. Like he um, helped found a company in Huntsville, Alabama, or he was a, a, a part of this company called Intergraph. And they got a contract with NASA for the Apollo program. And he was an electrical engineer and he helped design space shuttles for NASA for the Apollo program. And when the company got the contract with NASA, their stock just went crazy. So part of the things for him working with them is he had all the stock. So that made him a millionaire. Um, and then he took that money and invested it and in, in the stock market. And so my grandfather gave, he, he, he was this amazing business guy growing up and uh, my mom always talked bad about him, but he bought our house that we grew up in. Um, I needed braces when I was a kid. He paid for all that. I mean, like, like I was actually sitting in prison a little bit before he died a few years ago and writing him and just saying, man, I just appreciate you so much. You, it was you that gave me everything my whole life, you know, and he would come on, uh, on Christmas and um that was pretty much we'd we'd see him once a year and uh but yeah he was a he was an amazing man very very thankful to have had him in my life that's awesome my man jonathan if folks want to figure out this business coaching thing with you they want to reach out to you what's the where can you go where can they find you well, my website is uh, being changed right now. Uh, it should be live in the next two days. So by the time this is published, I'm sure um, that would be sunstonecoaching.com. That's S-O-N, stonecoaching.com. And, you know, then my social media profiles, it's pretty much everything is at the Jonathan Field. Awesome. Thanks so much.